take two bar magnets, place them side by side with like poles facing, they repel. That's basic magnetism. Now, take two coils of wire, run the same current through both in the same direction, each coil should act like a bar magnet. So, what do you think will happen? They should repel too, right? They don't. They attract. It's not what you'd expect. And it's not something most textbooks ever mention. But 200 years ago, André Marie Ampère uncovered this exact behaviour. He didn't just observe it, he built a theory to explain it. A law that treated electric currents as real physical entities interacting directly with one another. Not through fields, but through force. And his experiments were so precise, so compelling, that James Clerk Maxwell later called Ampere's discovery one of the most brilliant achievements in science. A law proven by experiment not to be ignored. And yet, that's exactly what we did. Ampere's law wasn't just a curiosity. It posed a challenge to the very foundations of how we think about electricity, magnetism and the fabric of space itself. We all learn that like charges repel, but set them in motion and they start to attract. So what happens to the repulsion? Does it just disappear? Or have we simply stopped looking for it? Today we're taught that currents are driven entirely by the electric field. The magnetic field just appears as a kind of perpendicular effect. In a wire, electrons drift slowly forward, pulled by the field, while at the same time generating a magnetic field that attracts other currents. And the repulsion between moving charges? According to the textbook, it simply cancels out. Symmetry takes care of it. Nothing more to see. The standard model assumes that in a steady current the repulsion from charges ahead and behind perfectly balance, leaving only the magnetic attraction. The longitudinal force are treated as negligible, hidden in the maths or just ignored. But this assumes something very convenient. That equilibrium happens instantly and perfectly, even in systems thousands of times longer than the charges themselves. And as we'll see, reality doesn't always agree. In 1820, Hans Christian Ørsted made a surprising discovery. A current carrying wire could deflect a nearby compass needle. It was proof that electricity and magnetism were somehow connected, a shocking idea at the time. News of Ørsted's experiments spread quickly across Europe. In Paris, André Marie Ampère immediately set to work. Ørsted had shown that electricity could create magnetism. But how exactly did currents exert forces on each other? Could it be measured? Could it be described? Within weeks of hearing Ørsted's results, Ampère stood before the French Academy and demonstrated that two parallel currents attracted each other and currents in opposite directions repel. But he didn't stop there. Over the next several years, he developed an entire theory of electrodynamics. He designed clever experiments, isolated tiny current elements and measured forces between them. What he found was remarkable. Yes, moving charges attract sideways the magnetic force we all learn about. But they also don't stop repelling each other along their path. Ampere's experiments made this clear. Charges moving in the same direction still push each other head to tail. A longitudinal repulsion that standard models don't include. He derived this force mathematically, not as a correction to magnetism, but as a fundamental part of how current elements interact. And in the lab, he found ways to isolate and test it. One of his cleverest setups used tightly wound coils, what he called helices. Each turn of the coil contributed a small element of current, some running side by side, others aligned head to tail. Now, according to standard thinking, these coils should repel each other, like two bar magnets aligned the same way. But instead, they attracted. This wasn't evidence of a new attractive force, it was evidence that the standard picture was missing something. Ampere realised that in the geometry of helices, some of these longitudinal repulsions didn't cancel, they shifted the balance. The sideways attraction and head-to-tail repulsion combined in a way that reversed the expected outcome. It was a powerful demonstration, not of magnetism, but of direct forces between moving charges, acting in ways the magnetic field alone couldn't explain. It was all one force, but with two distinct faces. One pulled sideways, the other pushed along the path. Both effects were real, 
Both were measured. Both were written down in his magnus opus. But that head-to-tail repulsion wasn't a separate force, but a different aspect of the same law. Ampere's equations described a single interaction, one that changes with geometry. When current elements run side by side, the dominant effect is attraction, the magnetic force we learn in school. When they're aligned head to tail, the same interaction becomes repulsion. It's a powerful force, but only when the charges are organised. If their motion is random, like drift ions in a gas, the net force cancels out. It's not just motion that matters, it's coherence. Standard theory ignores this repulsion entirely. It treats magnetism as a separate field, and assumes that any longitudinal effects are either negligible or cancel out. But Ampere showed something deeper. That one law, properly applied, could explain both the magnetic attraction we know and the hidden repulsion we've forgotten. At the time, this wasn't controversial. Newton's gravity and Coulomb's law were already understood as instantaneous forces acting at a distance, and Ampere assumed electrodynamics worked the same way. He even emphasised that the forces must obey Newton's third law in its strongest form, equal and opposite, and aligned along the straight line connecting elements. In his view, a force that acted off-axis or failed to reciprocate would violate basic mechanics. For decades, Ampere's ideas didn't vanish. Wilhelm Weber even built on them, formulating a more general law that applied to individual moving charges, and included their relative velocities and accelerations. For a time, it was widely used, especially in Europe. But, by the 1840s, the tide had begun to shift. In 1944, Hermann Grassmann introduced a novel mathematical technique, a kind of early vector algebra, to express physical forces geometrically. His formulation inspired what would later become the cross-product structure of the Lorentz force law. But, unlike Ampere's original law, it didn't allow for longitudinal forces those acting along the line of motion. Instead, it only described sideways interactions between currents. It was a shift in how electrodynamics could be framed, more compact and mathematically elegant, but subtly incomplete. A few years later, Franz Neumann took a different approach. Instead of focusing on the forces between current elements, he re-expressed the interactions in terms of energy, introducing the concept of potential energy and mutual inductance between circuits. This shift made it easier to incorporate energy conservation into electrodynamics, and it laid the groundwork for practical applications like generators and transformers, and introduced the concept of the vector potential. But it also pulled attention away from the underlying forces themselves, replacing them with more abstract system-level descriptions that didn't preserve the directional detail of Ampere's original law. The final step in abandoning Ampere's picture came with Maxwell and Lorentz. James Clerk Maxwell, inspired by Faraday's idea of invisible lines of force, recast electrodynamics in terms of local fields, electric and magnetic, propagating at a finite speed. His equations were brilliant. They unified electricity, magnetism and light into a single framework. But in doing so, they excluded any concept of instantaneous action at a distance. There was no longer room in the maths for Ampere's direct force between current elements. Maxwell didn't deny those findings, on the contrary, he called them one of the most brilliant achievements in science, and praised Ampere's law for satisfying Newton's third law more directly than any other formulation. But, practically speaking, his formalism couldn't accommodate it. Then came Hendrik Lorentz. Building on Maxwell's field equations, he introduced a new, compact expression for how fields act on individual point charges. This brought clarity and consistency especially in understanding how light, charge and radiation interact. But it also finalised the shift. Electrodynamics was now a story of fields acting on particles. The idea of charges interacting directly, of forces between current elements, was considered unnecessary, even obsolete. Later generations mistook emission for disproof, and quietly erased Ampere's original force law from the textbooks, along with the longitudinal effects it predicted even though it was never disproven. But when we overlook knowledge that was hard won, we also risk losing the wisdom we might one day need the most. And that thought really hit me when I came across this book, The Ultimate Guide to Rebuilding Civilization. I've always loved making sense of complex things, 
and I've always been drawn to diagrams and illustrations. I even keep my own leather-bound sketchbook where I force myself to draw in black ink. There's no undo button, no tearing out pages. It's a small reminder that even our mistakes can be part of the story we're building. And that's exactly what struck me about this book. It's not just a survival manual or a coffee table book. It's both beautifully illustrated, inspiring, and packed with step-by-step -step instructions that remind you just how much knowledge we depend on and how easily it can slip away. It's a fascinating look at how everything fits together. But there's also something else going on. After spending hours flipping through the pages, I started to notice strange details, small clues hiding in illustrations, subtle patterns. At first, I thought I was imagining it, but then it clicked. Each puzzle points to a piece of a bigger mystery, one that eventually led me to a hidden web page, though at the moment I'm still trying to crack the password. This is just the beginning of the quest. If you solve it, you join the Order of Seekers, and you'll even get a reward from Hungry Minds, plus bragging rights forever. If you're curious to explore it yourself, or you want a copy for yourself, the links will be down below. And if you use the code, you'll get an extra 10% off store-wide. For much of the 20th century, even those curious about Ampere's force had no easy way to study it. His seminal memoir was never widely translated. That began to change thanks to Brazilian physicist André Assis. He not only translated Ampere's work into English, but became one of the few modern defenders arguing that we had abandoned a crucial part of electrodynamics. Then, in the late 1970s, Peter Grano at MIT picked up the question again. He ran high current experiments sending powerful pulses through thin wires. To his surprise, he measured forces acting along the length of the conductor, much stronger than Maxwell's equations predicted, and entirely in line with what Ampere had described. According to standard electromagnetic theory, two main effects should dominate the magnetic pinch force squeezing the wire radially and resistive heating gradually vaporising it from within. Yet, in Grano's tests, the wires didn't simply pinch and melt. They fragmented violently along their length, as though being pulled apart head to tail. The speed of the breakup and the magnitude of the forces were far greater than the pinch force and heating could explain. When he measured these forces directly, they matched the predictions of Ampere's original law, including the longitudinal repulsion between current elements completely absent from the Maxwell-Lorentz formulation. These weren't fringe results. Peter published them in peer-reviewed journals, where they passed review but sparked fierce debate. And the more he measured, the more convinced he became. The problem wasn't just with experiments. It was with the theory. In Peter's view, and later his son Neil, the field-based model had missed the point entirely. We don't observe electromagnetic fields. We observe the forces that matter fields and Ampere's law describes these forces directly, not as a delayed field effect, but as an instantaneous interaction between currents, falling off with distance, but never truly vanishing. They argued that what we call an electromagnetic wave is not a self-sustaining interplay of electric and magnetic fields moving through empty space, but the collective effect of countless direct interactions between charges, nearest neighbours giving the strongest nudges, more distant ones giving smaller nudges, in Ampere's view, the wave is simply the cascading pattern of those interactions, which we interpret as having electric and magnetic components, but which are, in fact, two aspects of the same underlying force. Together, their work stood as a modern echo of Ampere's discovery, measured, published, and quietly ignored. Now, at this point you might be wondering, why does Ampere's force law still matter? I mean, it's a 200-year-old idea. Most textbooks don't mention it, even most physicists have never had to think about it. So, why dig it up now? Because, if Ampere was right, and the Grenoes and Assis were right to follow and restore his work, then our picture of how the universe is stitched together is incomplete. We like to think of electromagnetism as neat and local. Forces that propagate at the speed of light, carried by invisible fields no faster than they need to be. But Ampere's force hints at something deeper, a direct, immediate connection between moving charges, not mediated by a field at all. And here's the strange part. Even with instantaneous action at a distance, you still get what looks like a delayed effect. 
imagine a current being switched on in a mile-long wire. In Ampere's view, the first charges would feel the force right away. But those ahead are further away, so they feel it less. Only when the first few charges start to move do their neighbours feel a stronger push. And so the signal builds, cascading forward like a pressure wave. Not because the force is delayed, but because it's distributed. It's exactly what field theory predicts, but for a very different reason. In Ampere's view, there is no field doing the work. The charges act directly on one another, and that changes everything. It means that the so-called field is just a convenient summary, a pattern that emerges from the sum of all interactions. And if that's true, then the work isn't being done by empty space. It's being done by matter itself, by the currents. And that raises a deeper possibility, because if those interactions are instantaneous, but fall off with distance, then the vast networks of cosmic currents might be more than just structure. It might be connection. A real, physical link between moving charges, across galaxies, across clusters, across time. This may sound like metaphysics, but it's not. It's exactly what Mach proposed that inertia and motion arise from the instantaneous influence of the entire universe. So, what if the filaments we see stretched across the cosmos are more than just shaped by plasma and gravity? What if they are part of the machinery of interaction itself? Channels where longitudinal force ripple, shaping the universe in ways we're only beginning to guess. We don't know for sure, the textbooks don't talk about it, but the question remains, do current only interact through local fields, or is there a deeper, more universal thread connecting them? Ampere insisted we measure it, Maxwell insisted we respect it, and perhaps now, with the filaments of the cosmos glowing faintly in our telescopes, it's time we listen. <laughs>